Sir. Grab your wide margin Bible. If you're also joining us on YouTube, well, at least you will be later. Uh, greetings. Grab your Bible. We're in the Gospel of Luke. Uh, we're in Luke. I'm sorry, we're not in chapter 13. Don't listen to me. We're in chapter 11. Where's Les at? He just left out. I better not put that out on the air. Say I brought my switchblade for nothing. Oh. <laughs> no. No, we had supposed to have a class tonight. Okay. Luke, chapter 11, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for another great day here in your house. Lord, we praise you. We lift up your holy name here tonight. Lord, we pray that You'd inhabit the praises of your people. We worship you through the study of your word. And we worship you through doing what it says as well, Lord. Lord, we pray for wisdom and insight and understanding tonight. Help us to know you better. Help us to understand the text that we're looking at. But we come to you with open ears. Open, thanks to you for opening them. Open hearts. We pray you'd fill them with your revelation, knowledge, and insight into your word here tonight as well. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay. We're going to pick it up right about where we left off. Uh, let's pick it up in verse 13. Hey, Les. Hey, bro. An hour late? Oh, it's been five minutes. <laughs> we had our meeting, we had our flinging meeting, our, not our night flinging meeting. No, that's 12. Oh. <laughs> no. Okay. Verse 13. Luke eleven thirteen. This is where we left off. Remember, Jesus said, if you then, being evil, not, boy, what a humbling way to start this. Jesus looks at you and calls you evil. Those that were following him. He's not even talking that to unbelievers. He's talking to those that are good to their kids. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Now, this one scholar wrote, it is significant that the gift he selects as the one we most need and the one he most desires to give is the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. How are you? Fine, I'm sorry, boys. Ah, uh, it's okay. We just got started. We're in the Gospel of Luke. We are in uh, chapter 11. Verse 13. Now these charismatics, they twist this verse to no end. And they say, you know, look, oh, you can get the Holy Spirit if you ask. If you pray hard enough, sit on the end of your bed, 
do enough whatevers, you too can have the... No, no, that's not what that means. Let me read this other note. When, when the Lord spoke these words, the Holy Spirit had not yet been given. John 7, 39. We should not pray today for the Holy Spirit to be given to us as an indwelling person because he comes to indwell us at the time of our conversion. Where is that in the Bible? Two places. Romans chapter 8, verse 9. That says, anyone that does not have the Holy Spirit is not of him. And also, Ephesians 1, 13. Oh, by the way, church, that's where we're going to go next. After next week, we are going to start a verse-by-verse uh, -verse study in the book of Ephesians. So I'm really excited about that. That'll start a week from Sunday. Ephesians 1.13, let me read it to you. It says, In him, that's Christ, you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed. <coughs> Ephesians 1, 13. Paul said, you or ye were, past tense, sealed with the Holy Spirit of Arabon. In classical Greek, this word meant engagement ring. Now it's a earnest, a down payment, uh, a guarantee. <laughs> but listen to what he says. The gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, that is once once you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Now, here it is, verse 14 again. Who is the guarantee of our inheritance? So, all Christians have the Holy Spirit. That is such false teaching to ask you as a believer, have you received the Holy Spirit yet? Because if you're a Christian, you've received the Holy Spirit. If you Romans 8, 9 says, if you haven't, then you're not saved yet. But you don't need to send on the, sit on the end of your bed and beg God for anything. That's all bad, charismatic doctrine. Bad. Right? What's that? What's that? <laughs> hey, Delilah. Okay, let me get back to where we were here. Let's move on to this next section here. You know, so that, that, that verse is in all the other Gospels as well. And, and uh, instead of Holy Spirit, it says gifts, if you've noticed any other Gospels. It says we should... Uh, um, that was verse 13, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the, all the other Gospels say also good gifts to those who ask Him? Of course, the greatest gift is the gift of the Holy Spirit. Okay, now let's move on to this next section here. Verse 14. The divided house cannot stand. Now, as he was casting out a demon, or and he was casting out a demon, and it was mute, 
So it was when the demon had gone out that the mute spoke and the multitudes marveled. All right, check it out again now. We learn that some sicknesses indeed come from demonic possession. Not always, but sometimes. Some sicknesses come from demonic possession. Some sicknesses come as a result of sin. Some sicknesses because it's one of those things and it's life. And some sicknesses come from God. Because the Bible says it's that way. Where is that? 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Those who take communion the wrong way. For this reason many are sick. And many of you have died. Says, Not discerning. The, for taking communion in a flippant manner. People ended up being sick. And dying. Okay. Verse 15. Some of them said, He casts out demons by Beelzebub, the ruler of demons. Oh boy, what a terrible sin this is. What these guys did. Crediting God's work to the devil. Beelzebub. Beelzebub means the god of poop. Dung god. D-U-N-G. Or as I like to call him, the toilet god. How ignorant are you? <laughs> when you spell out someone's name, that's what his name means, and you bow a knee and worship him. Oh, I worship the dung god. What can, you're a fool. What can I say? Some people worship what they do not know. Right? Isn't that funny? Even Elijah said the same thing. You know, when they're running around doing their chants, praying, he goes, where's your God? And when it says in the Bible, maybe he's busy, though that Hebrew construction of words is maybe he's sitting on your toilet. See, he hit them right back with their own name for Baal, which is lost on us in English. When he says, maybe your God is busy, he said pretty much, maybe the old toilet God's on the toilet. <laughs> lost on us in English. But, uh, okay, any questions? Any comments? Anybody? Darren. Good evening, Darren. I wondered that because of the word it instead of him. And let's read the verse again and try to ascertain if he's talking about the demon or the person. Okay? That's the way I had to try to figure this out. He was casting out a demon. This is verse 14. Luke eleven fourteen. 14. He was casting out a demon and it was mute. Now everyone can understand Pastor's question? Is it the demon the one that's mute? Or is it the person the one that's mute? And let's go on. So it was, when the demon had gone out, that the mute spoke. Now right there was, you see the difference. He's making a distinction here between the two. That after the demon had gone out, then the mute spoke. So the demon went on his way doing whatever he does. So I would say, no. I don't understand why the word it is there instead of him. It makes you think that possibly it was the demon he was talking about. So, so it was when the demon had gone out that the mute spoke and the multitude marveled. Some of them said, he casts out demons by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. Verse 16, others testing him sought from him a sign from heaven. Oh boy. I was wondering, where are the believers? Here you got two groups of people. One, half the group, credits the devil with what he's doing, and then it says the others 
test them? Isn't there a group that give glory to God? There's no one in this text who does that. It says others testing him. They sought from him a sign from heaven. But he, knowing their thoughts, said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and a house divided against a house falls. If Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? Because you say, I cast out demons by Beelzebub. And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by who do your own sons cast them out? Therefore they will be your judges. But if I cast out demons with the finger of God, then surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Boy, isn't that the truth, though, when he says that uh, a divided house, a house divided against a house falls. Mm -hmm. And that is true whether it's good or evil. No matter who built the house, if it's divided, like so many churches have been, right? Division in the church, a house that's divided against itself, can't stand. Or countries. Countries? Sort of like the United States? I mean, how can it stand? If in fact, like you said, Linda, that, that is a fact and not just a then it's just a matter of time. But I never thought of that as a country, and yet it is so true. I remember September 12th, 2001, up come the flags and out comes the saying, united we stand. Not anymore. All right, let's open that up for some questions or comments now. Did, did Lincoln say that in yes. the Grace? Yes. All right, now the question was, did Lincoln say a house divided against itself will not stand in the Gettysburg Address? No, oh, a uh, divided, it? yes, he did say that. Anybody else? What did he mean by the finger of God? In the account of Matthew's gospel, we read, if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. So it's got to be that the finger of God is the same as the Spirit of God. When Jesus said, I cast out demons by the finger of God, it's the same thing as the Spirit of God. The fact that Jesus was casting out demons by the Spirit of God was evidence, indeed, that the kingdom of God had come upon the people of that generation. The kingdom had come in the person of the king himself. The very fact the Lord Jesus was there performing such miracles was proof positive that God's anointed ruler had appeared upon the stage of history. Okay, verse 21. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are in peace. But when a stronger than he comes upon him and overcomes him, he takes from him all of his armor, which he trusted, and divides his spoils. He who is not with me is against me. And he who does not gather with me scatters. Now here's a good note I found on the strong man. I like this. Let me read this to you. Up until now, Satan was the strong man, fully armed, who held undisputed sway over his court. Those who were possessed by demons were kept in his grip, and there was no one to challenge him. His goods were in peace, 
that is, no one had the power to dispute his sway. The Lord Jesus was and is stronger than Satan. He came upon him. He overcame him. He took all of his armor from him and divided his spoils. Not even his critics denied that evil spirits were being cast out by Jesus. This could only mean that Satan had been conquered and that his victims were being liberated. And that is the point of these verses. Amen. That's great truth there. Carol. Uh, Bruce has a question. It says, does that mean that some people were casting out demons? He says, if I do this by Beelzebub, who do your sons do this by? I would say, yes, Bruce, apparently some were there. We read in chapter 9 as well, when they, when they walked by someone and they said, Master, these guys over here are casting out demons in your name. Should we call fire down out of heaven and burn them up? Remember? And he says, no. He said, anyone who is not against us is for us. So, yes, there were people casting out demons. When you get to the book of Acts, we find people trying to cast out demons. You had these Jews, unbelievers, who says, we cast you out by the Jesus that Paul talks about. And then the, divas, the uh, demon said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who in blazes are you? So it says the demons overcame them, and they ran and gave them such a beating, the NIV read, gave them such a beating that they ran out of that house naked. So, there's people trying to cast out demons. You can't cast out a demon by the Jesus that Les talks about. He's not the Lord his God. He's the Lord my God. If he's not my God, then... The light casts out darkness. Right. If you're not filled with the light, you're not casting anything. But I can't cast out darkness with his light. It's got to be my light. Same light that's in all of us. That should be in all of us. He's going to get to in a minute uh, those that don't have the light. For those whose eyes are dark. Darren? There's a reference to the Jewish exorcist at uh, Acts 19 13. Ah, that's what I just read. Read? Really? For that? <laughs> just came to mind. Darren said that there is a reference in your Bible to what I just read to you. Acts 19.13. Okay. Now, if you remember, Jesus just said just a week or two ago, last time we were here, that he saw Satan fall like lightning. Now, let's pick it up in verse 24. He says, When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest. And finding none, he says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it swept and put in order. See, the only problem with this condition is the demon must also find the house empty. And as a result, verse 26, it says, then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. And it happened as he spoke these things that a certain woman from the crowd raised her voice and said, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast that nursed you. Or in other words, she said to him, You know, laddie, you must have had a lovely mother, didn't you? And he goes, more than that, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Blessed. Blessed are those who hear the word. That narrows it down some. Blessed are those who keep the word. In this case, this word phulaso, the Greek word, it means to observe or not to violate. Blessed are you if you do what it says. Blessed are you 
if you keep the words that are written in this book. He promises you blessed. That's a great blessing too in the book of Revelation where he says, blessed are all those who hear and read and keep the prophecies written in this book. So, now, as to this swept clean house, I do not know what makes a demon temporarily leave a person. There's a few things I can think of. I mean, this demon, he says, leaves the person, right? Maybe demons can't stand praise music. Or pra praising God in general. Uh, what else did I write down here? I can speak for probably a lot of demons around here, and that is church. church. Try sitting an hour and 15 minutes in here on a Sunday. <laughs> Go ahead. Try. If you don't mind talking about salvation, blood, and your destruction, then come on in have a seat. That's up to you. We'll rejoice over it. If you can sit here and stomach us singing songs and praising the name of Jesus, and talking about in whom we have redemption through his blood. If you can sit here and listen to that for an hour, then you're on the wrong side, demon. You need to convert. <laughs> These are the only things I can think of that could cause a demon to leave a person. So, what's their condition here? They come here at 10.35 on a Sunday morning. They come here to hear Pastor Darren and Sharon singing. Now they're already uptight. <laughs> <laughs> then they hear some good old down old country preaching. Demon leaves. We haven't got that far yet. <laughs> I would say, Marjorie, that that's an option. Mm -hmm. You see, now, you see, you're left here, you've come to church, you had a demon when you got here, you don't have one now, or else we could have got here maybe Billy Graham Crusade. Good luck with any demon that's going to sit into one of them for an hour and a half. So, the demon's in the person. He comes there, he goes there, he goes there. He can't take it anymore. So now he's gone. And now here you are, an empty vessel. Man, oh man, you need to respond. What are you going to do? You might, I don't know how much time you, only God knows how much time you have. You might have a day, a week, a month, an hour, five minutes. You might have until you walk out the door. But for some reason that I can't see, this demon has done left you. And now, you see, now you can think clearly now. Whereas you never could before. Now the demon's gone. Now you can think. Now it's like a drunk that wakes up after a 10-year bout of liquor. Your eyes are open. Or like me, when I quit smoking, I could smell food again and yeah. taste it. I couldn't for years until I quit. And then, wow, my eyes were open. So it is here. You have a period of time, again, you guys hear me preach it all the time. It's why that word today is in the Bible. I don't know how long that's going to last. But you've got an opportunity, while it's still today, for you to, to do what you're going to do. Carol. Um, 
Bruce has something, and then I have a comment. Thank you. Bruce has a uh, question. It says, if a demon goes out of a person today, in today's world, and if they do not accept Christ, does that mean what you're saying, that seven more will enter him? Or could, I imagine? We'll let Jesus answer his question for him in a moment. And then my question was, uh, is this very, is this like a parallel to the, uh, the three types of soil? Is if, if you're at this Billy Graham crusade, say, and you receive, and it, it's all good, and it's great, and then the snares of the world and the cares of the world take you, and you're driven further away, you're empty. Okay, the answer to that would be yes. The condition of your soil is going to dictate what path you choose, right? If the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches outweighs what you heard him say or what you heard over here, then you'll think about it. You might even say yes while you're here and then change your mind when you need. Jesus said some people don't understand and then they change their mind. Some people, because of the anxieties of this age or the cares of this world, change their mind and they walk. So there's a variety of different, well, there's three that he gives. That's probably not exhaustive. Mm -hmm. Of different heart conditions you can be in, which will decide. All right, so this is where, as far as I see it, this is where we're at. Any more questions or comments? And the back there. Les. Um, this is kind of a weird one, but. I like weird questions. <laughs> when I was younger, we had an evangelistic week one time. A little louder, Les. When I was younger, we Thank had you. No demon from hell can stop the halting of the preaching of the word of God. And no demon from hell can cast out the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is a strong one. Amen. All right. Amen. What a great comment. For those of you that didn't hear that, the Holy Spirit is the strong man. The, all of this changed when Jesus died on the cross. And when the temple curtain was torn in two. All of this changed. So that demon lost his authority over all of us mm -hmm. at that time. So you ask me my opinion, I would say that's probably not true. But i got to be careful saying that. Maybe God had reasons that That is possible, but certainly God didn't sit on his hands wondering what he's going to do about this poor preacher that can't speak. Well, there's a whole lot of preachers out there that aren't Christian. True. We know that. Paul said demons masquerade as, as, as ministers of righteousness. It's a whole bunch of them. A whole bunch of demons in the pulpit. 
You'll know them by their fruits. You know them by the Jesus test. Born of a virgin, lived a sinless life. God took a body, died on the cross. He's coming back again. He's the only way to salvation. He is the only name under heaven by which men must be saved. That's the Jesus test. Either you pass it with flying colors or you flunk. Didn't John say no one can say Jesus is Lord except he be of God. Of God. Thank you. Anybody else? One more comment. Um, it ties both of these sections together. Um, it, my question or comment ties both of these sections together about the demoniac and um, the house being swept clean. Yes. There's people in the world today that believe they can cast out demons. And you know many do. Yes. But they also have to be ready to sit and stay with the person that they've just cleaned their life up and make sure that they receive Christ, that it's real, and then mentor them. Or you're the one who left the door open because the person doesn't know any better. Well, that's what Billy Graham always did. That anytime someone came to the Lord, they were assigned counselors that from their district, from where they lived, they were given someone that was going to watch out over them to make sure that that didn't happen. Because mm -hmm. Jesus warns that that happens to people when they first, when they first, uh, come to Christ. Yeah, come to Christ. They don't know. Hate to even say it that way. How can you come to or Christ and yet, you know, except other than to say that some people come to Christ and it's short lived. You must cross the finish line in faith. There's no other option. John said, though they came out from us, they never were of us. Because if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. All Christians cross the finish line in faith. Right. You're either born again or you're not. Right. If you're born again, the Holy Spirit now is, is doing the work in you. Right. Uh, discipleship. Right. Disciples. Right? That, that takes time. Right? That means you've got to hang around for a little bit. Yeah. Right, like she said. <laughs> no one heard that. No, no, no. Everyone heard that. No. That, that. You will cross the finish line in faith. Dimension. And it's us to, to hang around someone like that who is a new believer, for an extended period of time. We do that always here, forever, right? I mean, if you're a new believer, you are always have a family here. You'll always have friends here. My door is always open. There's friends here that care about you. You'll always have someone to watch. All churches are supposed to be that way. If it can't, then your church is too big. Or other problems. One request of you. What's that? That if there's new Christians listening, how do they ensure this doesn't happen to them? Okay, good question. If you are listening or watching this, maybe you're watching this on YouTube and you're an unbeliever. And how can you ensure that this doesn't happen to you? You swing this over, everyone can hear me. When your house is empty, you have to make a decision. The Old Testament, it says there's thousands that are in the valley of decision. What are you going to do? You have, when your house, when you can finally see clearly because God shined his grace on you and he flicked the demons out of your life and you can see clearly, the Bible says today is the day. You must make a decision while you can still think for Christ. What do you do? You call on the name of the Lord. The Bible says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord Jesus will be saved. 
You're calling it. The Bible says, with the heart you believe, with the mouth you confess. So if you hear, if you hear this, if you see this, if you believe because God's given you the gift of faith, then you call on the name of the Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. I thank you for breaking the power, the demonic power that was over me. Thank you for opening my eyes, and I receive you today. Hallelujah. And it's as simple as that. It's, it's, it's easy. You don't need to burn one calorie. You don't need to give me any money. All you do is call on the name of the Lord Jesus. That's an excellent question. Thank you. Looks like here comes another one. Where's my collar not on right? Removing yourself from the old life. Oh, okay. You go back to the bar, back to the drugs. Now, let's continue with this parable here. It's probably not a parable. Uh, Have we finished this? Yeah, we're 29. Yeah, 29. All right. Yeah, the end was. That was your answer, my answer right there. Right. Hear the word of God. And yeah, verse 26 was the answer, is the end result. It says, then the, the he, that's the demon, goes out and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself and they enter and dwell there and the last state of that man is worse than the first. So that's the end result. The house is swept clean means that God's shown his grace to you. He's, he's, he's filled you with his, his... Everyone at some time in their life is going to have the mercy of God overflow them and the grace of God. And he's going to reach out and he's going to be good to you. He's always good, but he's going to do something awesome in your life and chase these demons out where it's just you and him now and you got the opportunity to make things right. And if you don't, then this demon's going to come back and he's going to have some of his pals with him. And Jesus said, you're worse, Kate. You're going to be ending up much worse than you were before. So, okay, now let's go on here. Now, verse 29. For all you sign seekers out here, verse 29. While the crowds were thickly gathered together, he began to say, this is an evil generation. It seeks a sign. And no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah the prophet. All right, so this was an evil generation because why? They sought after a sign? Is that what made them evil? Unbelief. Right, it was an evil generation because they didn't have any faith. Their unbelief, like Carol just said, that's what made this an evil generation. And the sign of Jonah the prophet ultimately was to repent. Forty days. My Greek Old Testament says Jonah gave him three days to repent, not forty. Three days. And they repented so much, they put sackcloth on all the dogs and cats that lived there. <laughs> Boy, can you imagine seeing your dog or putting sackcloth on your dog? Arr! No? <laughs> the mind's going without one, right, Sharon? A little cooper full of sackcloth. They, they put it on the animals there, the cows all had sackcloth. And now Jesus is saying, you, for this guy that comes into your town and he hates you, 
Jonah hated these people. He couldn't stand them. He wanted all of them to drop dead. And he comes in and preaches, and you put sackcloth on your dog? And now here comes someone that's going to die on the cross for you. How much worse is your treatment of the Son of God than of Jonah? He says, someone greater than Jonah is here. Someone greater. Of course, the other sign of Jonah was spending three days in the belly of the whale. And Jesus compared that to himself, spending three days in the heart of the earth. So for all of you that doubt the truthfulness of Jonah in the belly of the whale, you now have a bigger problem. And that is Jesus says that it happened that way. I'll never forget when I was a kid. We were in an Episcopal church. And the preacher goes, no, nah, I don't believe that story. Of That's just a, that's fiction of Jonah. And, uh, and my dad, he was like, have you ever seen Spot on the Munsters? <laughs> Whoop, when the chair, and then that smoke comes out of his nostrils. Boy, was my dad mad. He took four Espositos and boom, out the door. Thus was our relationship with the Episcopal Church. <laughs> <laughs> so let me see. Father Know It All says, don't believe it. Jesus says, believe it. You now have a choice to make. Who are you going to believe? Do you believe the traditions of the church or do you believe the Son of God? Amen. Only you can choose. We look here every day. We look and see how truthful his word is, how everything he ever said has come to pass, how everything his future is going to come to pass. He's perfect in everything he's ever done. Everything that he's ever said, he's telling you that this is true. Why would you not? If you doubt Jesus. That is evil unbelief. Isn't it funny? He gave credence to the two hardest things for people to believe. And that is that Daniel wrote the book of Daniel. He says, as he said, as. Uh, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place. No one believes Daniel wrote Daniel. Half the church doesn't believe Daniel wrote Daniel. They said, oh, it was a forgery because there's too many prophecies in it. Huh? The two greatest things that people, the church won't even believe is that Daniel wrote Daniel and that Jonah was in the belly of a great whale for three days and three nights both of those things Jesus singled out as real. Because he knew. Hmm? He knew. They He's God. The so he settled it back then by his word. Yes. I just realized, I said, he settled it back then by his word. And if you don't believe that what he said is true, and he did settle it by his word, he's going to settle it again. And you're with all of these other unbelievers here. An evil generation. Okay, verse 30. For as Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites, so also will the Son of Man be to this generation. The Queen of the South will rise up in the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And indeed, one greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And indeed, one greater than Jonah is here. Oh, I'll tell you what, these Ninevites... This was one of the most evil cities on the face of this globe. They were wicked, wicked evil people. And God loved them so much that he sent his prophet there to preach to them. 
generation worse than the Nineveh, than those who saw the Son of God in the flesh. Why is this worse than them? This is the generation that is getting it first hand from God himself, not from Jonah. Jonah You're saying because we have got the word of God made more sure, and they didn't have that. Well, I'm saying it'd be a sterner punishment because they're getting it directly from God in the flesh. God standing in front of him. With, with Jonah, God told Jonah what to do. So that's second hand. This is God himself standing in front of this generation. So I would imagine that this generation would be a little bit more account, accountable than, than Jonah's generation. Well, certainly Jesus was saying this generation here in this text is more accountable. When the most wicked city on the face of the earth is going to stand in judgment at the end of the age against them. Right? right? The I'm not talking about the generation that we're in. I'm talking about the generation okay. that Jesus is standing in front of right I now. I thought you meant ours. That's why I should yeah, explain yeah. that to me. Oh, most assuredly. Absolutely, that's right. Anybody else? Everyone follow what he said. He meant the generation that saw the color of Jesus' eyes is much worse off. Right, they witnessed the miracles. They with their own eyes. All those hundreds or maybe thousands that stand in at Lazarus' tomb when he says, Lazarus, come forth. And out comes a dead man wrapped in grave clothes. And half the people went and ratted him out. They ran to the Pharisees to rat him out. The other half believed. What group are you in? Praise God, I know the answer to that here, but maybe for those of you that are watching. If you believe now, it's because God's opened up your heart to respond. And we're running really short of time here to the end of this age. Now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation to call on the name of the Lord. Okay, let's move on here. A little bit left. Uh, okay, rejecting the Savior. Verse 33, no one, when he's lit a lamp, puts it in a secret place or under a basket, but on a lampstand, so that those who come in may see the light. The lamp of the body is the eye. Therefore, when your eye is good, your whole body is full of light. But when your eye is bad, your body also is full of darkness. Now, the King James here has it right. It's got, again, that word paneros means evil. So it's not so when your eye is bad. It really should be when your eye is evil. Your body also is full of darkness. Like the old saying. Have you ever run into anyone with an evil eye? They don't Scott's live musing in the back row on that. You know what I mean? Not grandma, I can tell you that for sure. I don't, I don't mean stink eye. I mean evil eye. <laughs> No, no, I'm actually literally I said, evil eye. Haven't you ever gone to 7-Eleven before or the supermarket or the store and you look at someone and they're just evil and you know it and you feel it and the hair stands up on your arms? Ever had that happen to you? Likewise, on the other way around. Look in the eyes of Chuck Swindoll. Charles Stanley, Adrian Rogers. And you see it when you look in these people, just the exact opposite. They're like beams of light, especially Chuck Swindoll. When, when you look at it, it's just, there's just something about these people. There's something about, and there's something about you. 
And you can make people's day wherever you go. And I know a lot of you do. Just by smiling at someone, by saying God loves you or God bless you. Or else have you ever had anyone hate you for no reason? Have you ever had anyone fear you for no reason? Where you go somewhere, I know it's happened to you. You've worked with people that way and others where people just, they fear you when they've never even met you. That's because you're either one of these here. Either your eye is evil and you never did make the, you never did respond by faith. But the good news is if you're convicted of that, it's not too late. Right, because you're not going to give a rip once it's too late, and you're going to change the channel. But if you're convicted or upset that you did that, it's the Holy Spirit working in you. It's never too late as long as the Holy Spirit's prompting you to make a decision for Christ. That's the devil's greatest lie is to tell you it's too late. You wouldn't be in this house. You wouldn't be watching. You wouldn't be listening. You'd be doing something else. Don't fall for the greatest lie that it's too late. As long as it's today, however long that is. Like my little favorite restaurant, I got that little sign up there. It says, free coffee tomorrow. <laughs> There's only one problem. It's never tomorrow. Simple little thing. Why, you don't like free coffee? No, she drinks a lot of coffee. Oh. oh, you'd be like the 400 pound guy that goes into the buffet, free buffet Tuesday. Oh no, you would leave. <laughs> no free buffet for you. All right. Verse 35, therefore take heed that the light which is in you is not darkness. If then your whole body is full of light, having no part dark. It's not funny how you can have part dark. You think it'll all be one way or the other. Maybe your house is a couple different things going on. Maybe what he means is the light is going out. Or you're letting the light go out. Maybe. But this person is not completely one way or the other. There's more than one. This is like Sybil here. You're pointing to your wife. She said maybe they're lukewarm. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Lukewarm. That's my sermon this week. Did you know that? <laughs> <laughs> Do the game, Lord. <laughs> That's my sermon this week. Priority mail to lukewarm church. What do you do if you find yourself? Well, first, first me address that. If you're lukewarm, you see, lukewarm is 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 us saying grace for 25 years. God is great. God is good. We thank you for our food. Amen. Use a little zeal with what you do. Lord, bless this food to our use and us to thy service. Isn't it funny? 50 years later, I still remember my mother's prayer. Half-hearted, just because it's 6.30 on a Monday. Four snickering fools waiting to eat. Half-hearted. You got nothing of nothing. You can't get a huge demon to chase you. Right, lest you fall. Carol? I was just thinking of um, in verse 36 where it says, um, uh, where it refers to being half no dark, part. half light. Like maybe a, a logs on a fire. If you just sit there and the fire's going out and you don't get up and stoke it and do something so the fire will survive, 
It's going to go out. You're going to be in darkness. You're going to be cold. Yeah, that's a good analogy. What else? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You may have a dark closet. <laughs> dark closet? Yeah, that closet is dark. See, the door closed. It's always dark in there. That part of your heart. Can't hear me. Yeah. Thank you. Be in my office later. Keep the door closed in your heart, in your closet, in your heart. Exactly. Guard it. Always closed. You never need light in there. And Jesus needs to be in there as well. Right. That's the end of that text of the lukewarm. He says, Behold. What does he say? Right. You got it. I stand at the door and knock. It's funny, I was asking her to get that picture, so I wanted up on that slide. That famous picture of Jesus. Have you noticed there's no handles on that door? From the outside? You can't get in from the outside. Someone has to let you in from the inside. You stand here how many years. The Son of God created the world, and he can't open up that door. He's not going to do it for you. You've got to open up that door. You've got to do it. <laughs> Scared. Jesus said that he is the light of the world. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Jesus said he is the light of the world. Again, we're, we're, we're marveling over this, you know, part. I mean, there's some kind of struggle going on, right? Mm -hmm. Uh. Let me finish reading these, these two verses again. Verse 35. Therefore, take ye the light which is in you, which is not darkness. If then your whole body is full of light, having no part dark, then the whole body will be full of light, as when the bright shining of a lamp gives you light. Okay. Uh, and then we'll say goodbye. A friend of mine today and I were talking about this. Who? A friend of mine okay. today and I were talking about this. And I realized, and I told her, I said, the war's already been won. But it's up to us how we fight the individual battles. The whole war itself's been won. But we still have our individual little battles, our skirmishes. And if we don't, you know, like, he's at the door. Once we let him in, we have to close the door again. We have to be careful not to leave the door open. And... Things come in and out that aren't supposed to be there. Last verse, I'm going to ask Darren to pray for us. Uh, in Colossians chapter 2, verse, four, verse 15, it says, Having disarmed principalities and powers, he, at speaking of Jesus, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. So definitely, we've got the victory. It's already been won. And he has triumphed already. It's already, it's already it's a done deal. That's Satan's greatest deception is to try to get you from knowing that, that the battle of the war is over. He has defanged the enemy. All he can do is roar like a lion, but he can't hurt you. All right, if you're watching again here online, thanks for joining us on Facebook and uh, on YouTube. And uh, be with us again on this Sunday here as we indeed, we're going to break into the pastor's office, the one pastor whose email I don't want to read. I'd rather be on the golf course or fishing with Danny than to break into this pastor's office to have Jesus tell them, you make me want to puke. That's what he says. Make me want to vomit. So join us uh, on Sunday morning. <laughs>